Uh, it's a real delight to be here. Thank you so much for inviting me. I'm going to talk to you about some stuff, and um, I know that I had a title. I pointed it the right way. I, I know I had a, a title in the thing about something else. Um, we'll get to pest control. But I wanted to talk a little bit about um, weevils, because they have really cool noses. Um, <laughs> So, uh, unfortunately, Travis has said everything that I'm going to say in the start of my talk. No, so I want to talk about what we've been doing in, as part of Project 2. Uh, what, there's our big Project 2 team who've been doing stuff for the Bioprotection Research Centre, and how that forms has sort of informed my thinking about what we need to do in the future. So we will talk about pest control. I'm not going to talk about gene drive specifically, but I am going to talk about what I think our challenges are, and, um, and, it, and it's going to get a bit opinionated and shouty. Okay, so just strap in. <laughs> Uh, sorry. Um, so uh, uh, we've already kind of introduced to this guy. This is, um, I could, got a pointy thing here. Do I have a, I do have a lazy, there we go. So this is the Argentine stem weevil, uh, which is, I must admit, my favourite stem weevil. Um, it's, a, a, it's, a, it, it's a pest. Um, it's a pest of grass. In particular, it's larvae burrow into the grass and they cause damage to grass. And, you know, what New Zealand sells effectively to the rest of the world is grass. So we have a problem here. This affects uh, the basis of a lot of our pastoral industry. So that's a big issue. And, of course, it causes pasture damage like this. This is not tasty uh, for sheep or cows. This is uh, Argentine stem weevil territory. So stem weevils are a problem, and they've been a problem for some years, and now it's not working. Come on. You know you want to. There we go. Um, so uh, stem weevils were first recorded in New Zealand in 1927. Uh, when we assume that they came in from uh, forage being brought from South America, but uh, it's not clear who, why, where, you know, just a beard, or well, first recorded in 1927. It costs about 200 million a year, um, but that's the cost currently. Uh, it's controlled by um, something we're going to talk about in a moment, and so this is the cost after all of our control measures. It's hard to kill with insecticides because it's encapsulated within the leaves at its census of status, so it's, if you wanted to use insecticides to kill stem weevils, you have to treat with a hell of a lot of insecticide. It's also um, affected by endophytes in the grass, but endophytes, obviously, um, the endophytes that are effective against this weevil often cause ryegrass draggers in stock as well. So there's a sort of balancing thing here. So it's a problem. It was a problem that we thought, uh, well, at least Stephen Goldson thought we had solved um, by the introduction of a parasitoid wasp, Microtonus hyperide, which was brought from Argentina and released between 1989 and 1990 around New Zealand. And remarkably, this turns out to be one of the most effective biocontrol programs in the world. When this wasp was first released, let's have a look at the wasp. There he is, or she is. Um, uh, we got rates of up to 80% parasitism. So 80% of the stem weevils and pastures were carrying around a larva of this parasitoid wasp. And what happens is the, the parasitoid lays its eggs in the weevil, the egg hatches into a larva, the larva dangles about, eats the weevil's insides, and finally hatches out, killing the weevil. Right? So 80% parasitism means our populations of stem weevils were crashing. So that's great news. Wonderful. And biocontrol systems, are distri they distribute themselves. The, the wasp goes everywhere, and it's self-sustaining. It's wonderful. We've solved this particular problem. The issue is that we haven't. And if the next slide... There we go. Uh, what has actually been seen... Oh, it's I've messed up my slide somehow. Um, what you see in uh, this, these graphs from a paper which you can't read... Uh, is that there's been a steady decline of this biocontrol over time in lots of different areas. Down from it, if you look at this Waikato where we've got great data, you've got like 80% parasitism and it's now dropped to sort of below 20%. That's over a considerable period of time, but this is a huge difference in the number of Argentine stem weevils in our pastures and the damage that's going to be caused and the control measures that need to be done. This is a massive cost. Um, as Travis told you, I just pointed at you. There we go. <laughs> um, uh, one of the, the jobs, uh, what, one of the things that Project 2 did in the Bioprotection Research Centre is monitor Argentine stem weevil populations up and down the country. There's a massive number of um, sites that were monitored, and the outcome of that is that if you look at uh, all of those sites, there has been a parasitism decline from 70% or, or above down to 10% and above, and that decline is really related to the years after the first parasitoid release. So you release the wasp, and you've got 24 years of good, of reasonable biocontrol. But then it's game over. So that's really unusual, and un certainly unusual for a biocontrol system. Why this would happen makes not a lot of sense. And so one of the jobs of, of Project 2 was to try and understand what was going on here. And the problem is, 
to, to be blunt, what we have here is a pest that was, um, you know, came to New Zealand, nobody really knows anything about it because nobody cares in Argentina, and a parasitoid wasp that I have reliable, reliably been informed Stephen Goldson found on the lawn of a hotel. Um, <laughs> Brought to New Zealand, very effective biocontrol, but actually we know little about it. There's been lots of work on looking at how it might parasitise, what other off-target effects there are, but it is a system which is working and therefore we've kind of said, well, you know, it's fine, we'll be all right. So Project 2 and a whole load of other people around the country have been trying to work out what's responsible for this decline. And it's something to do with me pointing in the wrong direction. So one thing we thought, instantly being geneticists as well, Obviously, if we've got a stem weevil population and a parasitoid that comes in and starts killing that stem weevil, then we should see, if those stem weevils are becoming resistant to the parasitoid, we should see strong selection on stem weevils, right? Only those stem weevils which are resistant should survive, so we should see that in the genome. So we looked uh, at whole genomes, so we sequenced the whole genome of the Argentine stem weevil, which turns out to be big and ugly, uh, and we did genotype by sequencing of stem weevils from up and down the country, and the answer is we can't find a clear sign of a resistance locus. There is signs of genetic variation in the population, so there's a north-south cline. Uh, weevils in the north of New Zealand are very different to weevils in the south of New Zealand, and there's a massive amount of variation. Not consistent with stem weevils came into the country once and spread throughout New Zealand, more consistent, in fact, with our modelling, suggests multiple introductions of this beast. We've got stem weevils, they have a lot of genetic variation. So that didn't help. It was expensive, it didn't help. Um, we, so I think that's the, the motto of genomics. Genomics, expensive and doesn't help. Um, it's probably the wrong thing to say at this point. <laughs> okay, let's think about COVID. It's really helped with COVID, all right? <laughs> Sit down. Okay. We also thought, okay, well, what, let's try and understand what happens when a stem weevil is parasitized. So we have systems where we can look at gene expression Oh, now we've gone past. Okay. Uh, we can look at... <laughs> can I do it with a keyboard? Uh, no. no, okay. I'll, I'll just wave at you, shall I? <laughs> so, we've, uh, so this is a complex slide. We're not going to go through it in great detail, but we can look at variation in gene expression between weevils that are parasitised and not parasitised. Weevils we think that are... Um, infect, uh, that are resistant and weevils we don't think are infected. And the, the fact of the matter is we can find genes that are associated with these particular traits, right? So we've got genes that are upregulated and weevils that are resistant. What those genes mean is really hard to do. And I, I really want to thank the last speaker who talked a lot about taking genes and functionally testing them. And that's the most important thing here. So in a culture system with bacteria, you can do that. In a Argentine stem weevil, we cannot do this. We don't have permission to do it. We don't have uh, the ability to... Well, we probably could do it if we tried hard enough, but we would need um, containment facilities, which we don't have. So we can look at these genes. Um, we found genes that look to be associated with resistant or uh, genes that are parasitized. We can even look at the genes that are expressed by the embryo of the parasitoid in the wasp. So we've got some really cool data, and this is the work of Sarah Inwood. Also in here, beautiful timing, we have um, found a virus. So a sort of unknown virus. There were, there's been work on viruses in some other parasitoids, and viruses are often in parasitoids and are involved in um, affecting the host, but we also found an unknown virus. This virus... Um, oops, no, see, now you did the thing. Um, so this virus has... Uh, um, so in Microtonus hoparotic, which attacks the stem weevil, we've got this virus, in, and actually these, the, the virus that it's related to, there is only one of. So this is a kind of a new clade of viruses we haven't heard of before. We know it's a virus through complicated stuff, looking at read depth of, of the genomes and things. We know that this is actually an, uh, an infection that these, these wasps carry, and they transmit it onto the weevils. So this may be something to do with that parasitism role, but there's something interesting happening here we didn't know about. Um, so, but I haven't told you the smoking gun, right? The, the, there is no smoking gun here. What we haven't found is being able to say, look, here is why resistance is occurring. Okay? We have a general idea, and that's something that, that Travis talked about as well, and that is that uh, the stem weevil is sexually reproducing while this parasitoid which attacks it isn't. Okay? So this is a problem, and you think about this, if, it's, if a species is sexually rep reproducing, it's able to recombine its genome and produce variation, and that variation is able to be selected for. But the parasitoid attacking it is asexual, and therefore it's producing clones of itself. So it's very hard to see how it can change uh, greatly over time. And awesome modelling work from Paula, Stephen and Jason have shown that actually if you look at parasitism rate, if you model parasitism rates against 
sexual parasitoids, so we've got a, a, a sexual host with a sexual parasitoid or an asexual parasitoid, you can see within the asexual parasitoid, we predict that this will drop off over time. Something we never thought of before, but actually it's quite clear that this is a serious flaw in the way that we have thought about um, releasing parasitoids for biocontrol. So we have to ask the question, what the hell do we do about it? So we know that in New Zealand there are actually a bunch of weevils which are controlled by uh, parasitoid wasps. So there's the Argentine stem weevil controlled by Microtinus hyperidae. There's the lucerne weevil, which is also sexually reproducing. It's controlled by Microtinus ethiopoides, a sexual strain from Morocco. It's, you know, I don't know Morocco always seems like more sexual than... <laughs> <laughs> Uh, Ethiopoides, uh, the same species, another strain, an asexual strain from Ireland, uh, not surprised, um, <laughs> controls the clover root weevil, and finally we have uh, a French strain, which is sexual, which also attacks the clover root weevil, but doesn't, um, we don't use for biocontrol. And um, you can see that we've got some problems here. Argentine stem weevil, that's $200 million a year at the moment. Clover root weevil is $220 million a year at the moment. Clover root weevil is a massive problem. If this is released from its biocontrol, we're seeing, I think we're going to see major effects on our pastoral industries. It has an asexual thing. So we would predict at this point that we're going to lose control of the clover root weevil. So we thought to ourselves, is it possible that we could take some of these wasps? And as you see here, this species, Microtonus ethiopoides, has different strains which are sexual and asexual. So these are probably quite recently asexual. Is it possible for us to switch them back to sexuality? Can we understand how they're asexual and make them sexual again? Microtonus hyperoidae is probably sexual in its native range. It's just that Stephen chose an asexual one. <laughs> Say no more. Um, so uh, what we've done is we've sequenced the genomes of all of these guys here. We've sequenced the genome of the stem weevil. With Neil Gemmel, we've sequenced the genome of the lucerne weevil and the clover root weevil. And so we have genomes now of all of these species. Some of those genomes, let's go for slides, some of them that just go fast. Eh? So some of these genomes we've used high C, so we've got chromosome level assemblies of some of these wasps. <laughs> just keep pressing the button. We've looked uh, in particularly trying to look at genes associated with meiosis. So meiosis is the thing that does sexual reproduction, it's the form of cell division. So we were interested to see whether the genes associated with meiosis were affected in strains that were asexual. And uh, the answer was no, but yeah, keep going. I was gonna point, but we don't need to. We've also looked at olfactory receptors as a way to think about how these wasps are finding their hosts. Clearly, there are different strains of Microtonus ethiopoides which attack different weevils. How do they know? We reckon it's through smell, and actually there's a little plate I'm gonna Point of the thing, there's a little clade here. Uh, we found a whole set of olfactory receptors which are specific to this clade of um, parasitoid wasps, which we think might be involved in, in, the control, in the host control. But of course, I'm not allowed to knock them out and see whether my wasps now can't find their host, right? So we have this problem that you bacterial guys don't. <laughs> okay. The other thing we've discovered, and uh, this is a completely uninterpretable picture for most of you, but this is actually the ovary of Microtonus ethiopoides, a Irish asexual strain, stained for a gene uh, which is involved, stained for a protein which is involved in meiosis, and you can see this staining up here, these little cells, these are cells undergoing meiosis. So in fact, meiosis is unaffected, these guys are asexual, but they're doing meiosis anyway. So we've got, a, there are mechanisms why this might be occurring, but it suggests particularly root, particular roots to asexuality. We know what genes are involved in those roots. We have some ideas of cell signaling pathways which seem to differ between these things. In the lab, we can change the, some of those genes, and we have seen some signs of um, producing uh, embryos of different sex, but they're in the lab manipulations. And the thing techniques we're using are not things we can do outside of the laboratory. So it looks like we're getting to the point where we even might be able to change the sex, uh, change the, the switch back to sexuality in these species, but we're doing it with technologies that are not applicable on a broad scale, and that's our problem. You, someone's messed up all my slides. I blame you. It's, on, on the other hand, I don't blame you because you're changing the slides, so it's a great guy. <laughs> so the other thing that we're thinking about is saying, well, you know, are there ways we could make these wasps more effective? Uh, there's some wonderful work out of Australia that you'll be seeing in the media quite a lot recently, where they've manipulated the microbiome of uh, dengue fever carrying mosquitoes, and in doing so, they've blocked the transmission of dengue fever um, 
uh, in those mosquitoes. Those mosquitoes are being released in Southeast Asia, and we've shown uh, just a decrease in rates of dengue fever in, in areas where those mosquitoes have been released. This is not genetic modification, but it is messing around with stuff. So we're planning in the new bioprotection Aotearoa to do the same thing, looking at a particular problem in honeybees, which is deformed wing virus transmitted by the varroa mite. Can we block transmission of the deformed wing virus by messing with the microbiome? And the same applies with our parasitoid wasps. Can we mess with the microbiome and improve transmission of that novel virus we found? Can we cause a weevil pandemic and wipe the bastards out? <laughs> this is probably not the right time to be talking about weaponizing viruses. <laughs> But I do want to say, look, joking aside, our problem is our st control of stem weevil is failing, and Project 2 has done an enormous amount of work to understand why. But all our solutions to the problem are problematic. And that's because they involve manipulating biology. And manipulating biology is hard and controversial. I think we have to think about this in terms of not just our primary production, but also our conservation estate. And I'm not going to read all this, but I, the headline is, we're not winning. Those species in New Zealand which are endangered are becoming more endangered. Our native ecosystems are becoming more endangered. Our primary production systems are becoming less productive. And all of this in the background of climate change, which we all go, oh, and climate change is coming. Well, it's not coming. It's here right now. And it is affecting all of our systems. Let's look at that in terms of a weevil. Oh, I'm pressing a button, but you're doing it for me. So, this is my model of climate change. Like, it's going to get hotter, and that heat is going to move down the country. I know this is trivial and pointless, but Argentine stem weevils are distributed in the same way. Higher populations in the north, lower in the south. Our Argentine popula stem weevil populations are going to move south. Our resistance to the Argentine stem weevil is distributed in the same way. Resistance is higher in the north than in the south. So our resistant weevils are going to move south as well. So we're not just failing in our biocontrol, we're also going to have climate change, meaning an increase in the population of Argentine stem weevils. Pasture control is going to become harder. This has become, become more of a challenge. And that's absolutely, nice work, that's absolutely true of all our eco-climactic systems. I love this little picture. It's a, a picture of the, the Southern Alps, and you can see forest in the, in the valleys. You can see alpine meadows higher up. You can see the snowpack. Well, climate change changes all of this. The snowpack goes away, the alpine extends further into the, into the mountains, the forest tries to grow further, and all of this, if you look at the rate of climate change in New Zealand, which is faster than the rate of evolution. Our species are unlikely to be able to adapt to these sorts of changes unless they are already pre-adapted to do so. And those pre-adapted species are ones which have broad tolerance and broad range, and that's a pretty damn good description of invasive species. I think that our problems with climate change aren't just the climate is changing and sea level rise. I think we're going to see massive disruption to our ecosystems, both pastoral and conservation, and we need tools to deal with it. So do we have those tools? Well, these are the current tools that we have available to us, sort of available to us, uh, broad-range pesticides. Well, what we've learned in the past few years, and indeed in the past month, is that broad-range pesticides are an absolute problem. Right? Neonicotinoid insecticides are extremely problematic. Glyphosate, in a paper a couple of weeks ago, uh, has effects on insect um, melanization, which is its immune system. There's all kinds of problems. So they're going to be removed as a tool. We talk about targeted toxins. Predator Free 2050 is very keen on targeted toxins for rats. Well, I've developed targeted toxins. There's no market because the people who develop pesticides are large international companies who don't give a shit about targeted toxins for us. They care about markets where they can sell broad range things one chemical to as many people as possible. So that's a problem. They're also really hard to make, and they likely have off-target effects. We do have tools like gene editing and gene drives, but they're immensely controversial. I don't think we have social license to use them at the moment. Maybe we will get social license. These are useful tools, but currently they're tools that we can't use. Pest trapping and shooting is expensive and ethical implications, and I would challenge you to shoot Argentine stem weevils. <laughs> And as I've shown you, biocontrol isn't always the golden bullet, right? It involves the bringing in of new species, something we'd like to stop. Oh, come on, can't I have 20 minutes? Um, <laughs> there are off-target effects, there's failures, there's hitchhikers, this virus that we found, thank God, it really only affects these, these parasitoids. What if it actually affected our insects more broadly? So what can we do, in my opinion, and what we should be doing? Yeah, go on. 
Well, I think that the Bioprotection Research Centre and Bioprotection RTRO's role here really is in deep research, right? A lot of the time, when we start thinking about our problems, we don't understand them well enough. That's what I've learned about the Argentine stem weevil problem. We've learned a lot. Did we know enough to be able to stop the decline in, in control? We didn't. We might know enough now, but we don't have the tools. So we need to do the research and understand our environments. We need to understand what's happening in our urban primary production and conservation estate. So for example, in Europe, there's been a 70% decline in flying insects. That came about from a study generated by an amateur entomology society. I am really worried that we are not doing those studies in New Zealand. Have we had a 70% decline in flying insects? Stephen tells me that in the high country, the Mackenzie country, that may actually be the case for some of our native species, right? But we don't actually know because we're not looking. We need to generate the data that supports the use of the deployment of new tools, right? It's really hard to talk to you about gene drives being a potential solution for pests without being able to say, what are the costs and what are the benefits, right? That involves research in the lab to understand those costs and benefits. Nobody will say yes to something controversial unless you can say, this is what's good and this is what's bad about it. I think we need to make a sort of pledge here and I want you all to raise your hands. No, I think it's really important that everything we do is open, that our work is shared, our results are transparent, it's available to the public and other scientists. Because in the end, the solutions that are going to benefit New Zealand aren't going to be, uh, are going to be difficult to implement if they are controlled by individuals who own IP. Let's forget about IP, this is for the good of New Zealand. And I think the most important thing is that we as a group need to provide the people of Aotearoa with the tools, technology, the knowledge that empowers them to build and support resilient ecosystems, right? That's our job. We should be building that knowledge and then providing it transparently to the rest of New Zealand. Whack on the last slide. <laughs> Acknowledgements. Massive group of people here. There's a lot of people in Project 2, and I just wanted to point out that these people are from the University of Otago, Lincoln University, Ag Research, Plant and Food. Um, I can't. There's probably many more in there. <laughs> um, so this is a huge collaboration of people across institutions, across uh, New Zealand, and that I think is the real strength of a centre of research excellence like this, bringing people together who can actually answer the questions that we like. Uh, this work was funded by Bioprotection, out, uh, Bioprotection Research Centre, uh, some of it was funded by the Ministry of Business, Innovation and Employment, some of it by Genomics Aotearoa, and I am brought to you by the number seven and University of Otago. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs>